Hi there. Um, I want to begin with an apology. I've been working on grading your papers, but I've not finished them all yet. And I firmly believe that I should not post partial uh, graded papers until I have them all graded. So I will continue to work on those. Um, I've had um, quite a bit going on over the last couple of days, um, including um, something going on with my jaw here. So um, that um, affected me a little bit. So uh, all that's to say that uh, I, I hope to have your papers finished in the next uh, day or two and post your grade. Um, also, uh, just because it does hurt me a little bit, to uh, move my jaw too much. Uh, I will probably divide this lecture into two parts um, just so that you're you're aware of that um, and um, so don't be um, uh, confused if, if that is the, uh, the case. Um, we're wrapping up now um, medieval um, philosophy and um, so in the last uh, lecture, I spent quite a bit of time on Aquinas um, and his uh, philosophy, as it's sometimes referred to as Thomism. And um, I, I, I didn't add one uh, thing to that, and uh, I will uh, now. And that is toward the end of uh, Aquinas's life, he had uh, an experience that he never really uh, explained uh, other than it was just um, uh, uh, an ecstatic um, spiritual experience about two years before he died. And uh, this was some, uh, as best we can probably put it into words, it was some mystical experience whereby um, he had an encounter, um, a spiritual encounter with um, God, or so it seems that that's how he uh, described it. And uh, as a result, uh, he ceased all philosophical, theological writing at that point. And remember, he had spent a great deal of time trying to prove the existence of God. And it's at that point that um, he said um, that all of his words and all of his works had, uh, in essence, been like straw and that they were futile. Um, so it seems like that he had some experience of the divine, some mystical encounter with God, uh, and in so having that, uh, he felt like his attempts to prove the existence of God, to explain the existence of God and such, uh, he felt that that had just been um, futility and um, really just something that, that he should have given up on. Um, and uh, yeah, so whatever it was uh, that he experienced at that point, uh, it, was, it was profound. And um, he died, after this experience, he died two years later. So now we move on to another philosopher, and there's there's it's, he is uh, referred to as William of Ockham, um, and there are several things to to know about William, um, but only one thing that's really important to know about William. Um, so I, I will um, share a little bit about uh, William, but uh, there is one point 
that is most important about about William that I that I think I would want you to know. So William uh, lived around the year, uh, born around the year 1280, and died around the year uh, 1349. And um, he was born in a town of Ockham in Surrey, which is south uh, of um, of London, uh, in the south of England. But it's it's also um, a little bit south of London. If um, I had some experience in uh, Surrey, uh, this was about a year ago. I I was hiking uh, across. Uh, England, uh, the uh, Canterbury Trail, uh, which goes from Winchester um, in, in England to Canterbury and then on down to uh, Dover in England. And uh, the hardest trek for me uh, was through the hills of Surrey. Um, uh, portions of them were very sandy and portions of them were very rocky. And it was the most difficult of that 140-mile uh, hike uh, across England. Um, so William was born in a little town in edge in 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 the that area of in Surrey in England, and he was uh, educated um, at Oxford University. He became a Franciscan uh, friar. Um, which is the order associated with St. Francis of Assisi, and um, studied uh, there and, and um, became a Franciscan theologian. Um, William believed that, that um, all knowledge other than uh, revealed knowledge uh, sometimes called special knowledge. Revealed knowledge is uh, um, things like scripture. So if, if there are two types of knowledge then for William of Ockham, there is on the one hand um, revealed knowledge, which we put into the category of being um, spiritual things uh, in this case, we would we would talk about scripture being revealed, um, and, and that would be um, most everything that would be in that in that category of knowledge. So the books of the Bible then uh, are believed to be inspired by God, and that is revealed knowledge. On the other hand, we have, uh, according to William of Ockham we have um, sensory knowledge, um, knowledge that comes from our senses and our ability to observe the world and um, particular objects and events in that world. Um, so therefore, according to William, there is really no such thing as, as uh, metaphysical knowledge. Um, knowledge that goes beyond the physical world. So there is the revealed, which is scripture and is written down, and then there is sensory. So there is, uh, remember back to Plato, um, this idea that there are forms that exist out there somewhere, or in, in others um, um, who believe that the form was not out there somewhere, uh, the form of pencilness. Uh, so here you have the pencil, but um, out here somewhere in a realm unseen and unknowable, there is the perfect form of pencil, remember. Um, and so uh, um, William of Ockham is going to say, nope, this pencil out here doesn't exist. Now remember there was another competing view of that which says that there was a form, if you will, of pencilness that was perfect, but it existed within the pencil that you would have. Uh, and so 
perfect pencilness uh, exists here within the pencil that you have. That's a pretty neat trick, isn't it? I'll have to remember that the next time I have to record this in some way. Uh, so perfect pencilness then can't be separated out from the pencil that you would have and that you would be writing with, as opposed to a metaphysical sense. But this would also be the idea of, of the metaphysical perfectness of pencil existing within, even though the pencil that you might be writing with is not necessarily perfect, it does contain within it the idea of the perfect pencil. But for William of Ockham, this whole thing, this that exists here or within, it's just not. It is just the pencil. Um, and how you can then um, uh, understand that. Um, so there is only then the physical um, object um, reality and the revealed knowledge. So the revealed knowledge and the actual physical knowledge. No metaphysical ideas there. So for Occam then, the, the, the idea that I really want you to take away from, from William of Occam is what is commonly called Occam's razor, uh, as in a razor with which you would shave. Um, so if you, if you think about what a razor is, a razor blade, it can divide something, it can cut something. So if you think about Occam's razor as dividing, devising, cutting through something, it is cutting through um, uh, our understanding of things. And so in, in the shortest way of understanding Occam's razor, he argued that the simplest ex explanation for something was probably the true explanation, the explanation that you should go with. Um, when I worked in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in uh, the hospital, uh, they would sometimes refer to looking for zebras. And by that they meant that if you see hoof prints, um, you should assume that that's a horse. Um, don't go looking for a zebra. Um, so if, you know, uh, right now in the midst of the current pandemic that we, that we have, uh, COVID-19, uh, you might put it in these terms. Um, if, you, uh, if you present to the hospital uh, with a fever, and you've been to China, or you at this point you've been to New York, uh, and you present with a fever, and you're having a cough, um, and you've lost your tense, your sense of smell and uh, or your sense of taste, then the doctor is going to put two and two together, and the doctor is not going to say, "Oh, clearly you have cancer." No. Uh, the doctor is not going to go look for a zebra. Um, the doctor is going to take the simpler of the, of the two explanations and is going to say, you've been to a place where there's been a lot of COVID-19. You have a fever. You have a cough. You don't have a sense of taste. Therefore, you have COVID-19. And then you would be a presumptive case. And so they would give you then the test to confirm what it is that they suspect. Looking for a zebra would be trying to determine that you have some other illness going on rather than what is the most obvious and the simplest explanation. So that is Occam's razor. Uh, Occam was trying to uh, divide out the more complex, unlikely uh, conclusions and to go with the simpler of the explanations which is whatever your, your senses could reveal to you. So uh, you probably know it in this way. If it looks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, it has to obviously be a turkey. No, of course not. If it looks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. That's how Occam would simply 
uh, define this. So your senses are not going to deceive you um, in, in any significant way. So um, uh, assume then that the simpler of the explanations is what you need to go with. Um, your textbook gives you uh, an example whereby uh, you think about um, uh, your watch. Um, most of us don't wear watches these days, so uh, let's, let's maybe put it in terms of, of our iPhone, our cell phone. Uh, so we can think of our cell phone as uh, either being a, a complex uh, interworking of circuitry and um, electronics and basically uh, everything that would go into a excuse me go into a computer or we can think that there's somehow a magical um, uh, being that exists within here and if we could only uh, disassemble uh, this phone within it we would find um, uh, a, a magical little wizard who is answering our questions and, and doing all of that. Well, no, it doesn't make sense that there would be a wizard in here, but it does make sense that they would have taken computer parts and shrunk them down and made circuitry and, and other things that essentially uh, are uh, put together in components for uh, your, your cell phone. And so therefore, the simpler of the explanation is, it's just a little computer and not a little wizard that's existing within there. Um, so that is, that is um, Occam's um, razor then. Look for the simpler explanation. Don't go looking for, for zebras when it's probably just a horse. Um, so don't, don't go um, out there looking for those things. So he was very much uh, an empiricist. Uh, whatever knowledge could be derived from your senses. Um, and in doing this, um, he, he was, was essentially trying to um, um, do away with the proofs for God um, that Anselm and Aquinas had devised um, and simply saying that there was no need uh, for those sorts of things. Um, so Williams, then, his philosophy uh, existed in what we'll call nominalism. Um, nominal meaning naming um, something. is such that um, uh, Williams' nominalism uh, is such that only individual objects and events are real. And universality is a feature of language, not of the world. So universality, uh, the universals, remember, um, are these things that exist either out here or within. And Occam says, no, there is none of this. Um, it is simply in the thing itself. This is it. Uh, and so pencil is pencil, and that's all you really needed to know. Um, so that is... For example, we can talk about pencils, for example, um, as a universal concept. So there can be multiple types, multiple pencils, if you will. It can be yellow pencils and oh I've oh look, 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 here's a here's a here's a gray pencil and a blue pencil, and these are round pencils and these are multi-sided pencils like that. Um, but we know that they're all pencils. Um, so we can talk about pencils, for example, as a universal concept, but the universality in, uh, inheres pragmatically in the linguistic category. So it is a linguistic thing that we call these pencils, and we know that they're all pencils because of the name of them, rather than some uh, quality to them that exists either beyond them or some quality that exists within them. Um, um, it is simply that they are pencils. So William assumed that it is possible to create universal categories in language um, because of the actual similarities between the pencils. 
So you could know that these are pencils because they have graphite and wood and eraser. And so you look at the characteristics of them and you can name them all pencils, even though they might, might look different. There isn't some pencilness that exists out there or even within them. It is simply a, 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 a naming of them because of the uh, characteristics that they exhibit. So when it came to the idea of God, now remember, uh, Occam is a Franciscan friar. Uh, and as such, he does believe in God. Uh, and he believed in that, uh, that divine revelation, um, that, that uh, revelation, um, that special revelation that, that would come, um, that was not uh, sensory in that sense. Um, so that, um, that, that sort of knowledge. Um, and as such, um, he believed that if God is all-powerful, but that God cannot be investigated or analyzed, and that God is mysterious then, um, which he thought Christians must believe, then all events in the natural world must be contingent. That is, they are dependent because divine uh, power has the capacity to interrupt any series of events whatsoever, even those that we humans think are the most necessary. Indeed, there is, a, uh, there is proof of this in the miracles that we see in Scripture. So there must be a God because there are these things like miracles uh, that interrupt um, the, the course of nature, the things that our senses uh, could ordinarily reveal to us. And so then uh, there must be an all-powerful uh, God that is mysterious and beyond because miracles do exist. Um, uh, and so uh, William then... Um, uh, eventually got in trouble um, for his, his theology. And uh, the Pope um, called him in uh, to question him. And uh, at, at this point, now I want to put a parenthesis here in what I'm talking about and say that there was a period of time uh, about a, a, a uh, 60, um, yeah, about a 60 year period of time where uh, the papacy was not at the Vatican in Rome. In fact, there is a period of time uh, where uh, there were competing popes uh, in the uh, in the years between 1309 and 1377. So there was a pope in Rome, but there's also a pope in Avignon, France. Um, and uh, they were competing for primacy during this time. Uh, incidentally, uh, in the Eastern Orthodox uh, tradition and some others, there are other popes uh, as well. They still have popes. Forgive me, I have to answer this, and I'll come right back and pick up on that.